Well, I'm so glad you could join us again this morning. Let me mention that at the close of this message that we'll be celebrating communion uh, together. So if you want to participate in that uh, special and meaningful time as we focus on Christ's death on the cross for us, you're, you'll want to prepare by, by getting some bread or a cracker and some juice. And you may want to do that before you watch the rest of, of this video. In our church, it's our custom, generally, to celebrate uh, the communion service once a month, usually the first Sunday of each month. And the time and the frequency are not really based on any specific theological reason, frankly. The Bible just tells us that we should celebrate it and that it should be done with regularity. It doesn't say how often or when exactly, but we've chosen, like, like many Protestant churches, to have communion about once a month. The important thing is that we do celebrate it, whether it's the, the first Sunday of every month or every Sunday or some other plan or frequency, because it's clear from Scripture that Jesus meant for His people to commemorate His death and to do it in this way. Now, of course, the, the regular repetition of anything runs a certain risk, doesn't it? And that is that it will become just routine and that the form will be carried out unthinkingly without really entering into the, to the meaning and the significance of what we're doing, which is, of course, the whole reason for doing it in the first place. Uh, th that's when there's this danger of it becoming nothing more than, than just a tradition, and we're left with sort of a, a fossilized celebration of the communion service. In other words, like a fossil, there's, there's the form of something that was once alive, but, it, but it's only that. It's just the form without the life. And so I believe it's healthy from time to time for us to pause to examine again what the Bible has to tell us about the meaning and significance of the communion service. Why, why do we do this? Well, what's it mean? And so today we're going to take some time before we come to the celebration of the Lord's Supper to talk about the meaning of the meal, to, to give some thought to its importance and significance for us and to go back to the biblical foundations of this familiar but hopefully meaningful act. So if you have your Bible there with you, I invite you to open it to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 26. Matthew, the first uh, book in the New Testament, of course, and uh, Matthew chapter 26. We could, of course, look at in any of several passages that tell us about um, about when Christ instituted the celebration of communion. They're familiar passages for many of us, but again, their very familiarity sometimes becomes a barrier for us, doesn't it? And so I hope that today we can look at communion again in a fresh way. Not, not necessarily a new way, because it's certainly an old truth that doesn't change, but in a fresh way. So that if your celebration of the Lord's Supper has become fossilized, that God by His Spirit can breathe new life into your experience of communion this morning. So if you've got your Bible open to Matthew chapter 26, I invite you to follow along as I read. I'm going to read first verses 17 to 20, and then we're going to jump down to verses 26 to 30. So let's start at verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. All right, if you would jump down then to verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Would you join me in prayer as we look into God's Word together? Lord, what we've just read is, is a familiar scene with familiar words and familiar actions. But we, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand the tremendous importance and significance of these words and actions. 
And as we come to repeat those words and actions in just a few moments, may we do it not in an empty, meaningless way, but fully conscious of all that it means for us and how our lives would be completely different were it not for the truth that these communion elements represent and, and convey. So make your word uh, plain to us today. Make, make this communion service uh, fresh and, and alive to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, over these past few weeks as I've opened the newspaper, I've been repeatedly amazed and, and saddened by the number of obituaries each week. Right? You probably noticed that as well. One of the sad results of this pandemic has been the tragic loss of so many people. And of course, one of the things that makes it so difficult is that in many cases, people can't be with their loved ones in their final days and hours because of the restrictions that are in place to keep the virus from spreading. And another thing that uh, is that funerals and viewings and memorial services are also limited in certain ways. And in many cases, they've been, they've been put on hold until a later time. And that, that's understandable, I suppose. But it also makes it more difficult for people to have closure and to deal in a healthy way with their, with their grief and loss. And we've lost a lot of people here locally over the last few months. Today we're going to be looking at a memorial service. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you've thought about it in that way or not before, but that's really what communion is. It's, it's a memorial service. And in fact, we're specifically told that its purpose is to remember. Now, when we gather for a memorial service of somebody who has passed, we, we come together to, to remember that person's life, don't we? I mean, we, we, we do think about death, of course, because the circumstances force us to, but we don't really gather to commemorate and to honor that individual's death, but rather his or her life. So this morning, we're, we're going to be participating in a memorial service of sorts. That's what communion is. But there are several unusual things about this memorial service. One, of course, is that it took place originally before the person was even dead. Jesus presided over his own memorial service, in a sense, didn't he? But he said, here's what I want you to remember after I'm gone. But the other unusual thing about this memorial service that we call communion is that, unlike most memorial services, this one is specifically and intentionally meant to commemorate and even celebrate not the life of Christ, but his death. And we'll see why that's so important in just a moment. Now, the setting of this first communion service was, of course, what we call the Last Supper, the, the night before Jesus' death. Jesus was spending his last evening um, in quiet seclusion with his disciples. It was the first day of the Jewish uh, uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And as good Jews, they had met together to eat the Passover meal there in a friend's house. And the place is described in another one of the Gospels as a large upper room furnished and ready. And so we can picture them there uh, around a low uh, meal table, reclining on cushions on the floor, as was the custom in those days. And Jesus talked a lot with his disciples that evening about important things that, uh, in that time that they spent together. And, you, and you'll find much of that recorded in the Gospel of John in chapters 13 to 17. But Matthew and the other gospel writers tell us that at some point, while the meal was in progress, Jesus' disciples watched as he, as he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, that, that as he gave thanks for it, and he broke it into pieces and handed it around to them with the words, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, at the end of the meal, he took a cup of wine, he gave thanks for it, he passed it around to them, and he said, This is uh, my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now those are tremendously significant actions and words. And I'm sure that they stood out to the disciples because they were not the usual words that were said as part of the Passover meal. I mean, Jesus was kind of deviating from the script, if you will, that they were all so familiar with because they'd grown up hearing it every year at Passover. But for us, this is the familiar script, isn't it? And the danger, as we said, is that these words have become so familiar for many of us that they've kind of lost their impact. We don't really hear them anymore. And that's a shame, because the truth is that they throw floods of light on Jesus' own view of his death. By what he did with the bread and the cup, and by what he said about them as he did it, he was really visibly dramatizing his death before it took place and giving a clear explanation of its meaning and of its purpose. We don't want to miss that. 
So this morning I want us to focus our attention briefly on at least three things that Jesus was trying to accomplish in this commemoration of his death and that I trust will be accomplished here this morning in our own uh, celebration of communion. First, he wanted to make his death central. He wanted to, secondly, he wanted to make it understood. And thirdly, he wanted you to make it yours. Let, let, let's look at those one by one and, and talk a little bit about what we mean by that. The first lesson that Jesus was teaching in the communion service concerned the centrality of his death. During his last evening with them, Jesus was deliberately giving his disciples his instructions for his own memorial service, if you want to look at it that way. You know, many, many people leave, leave instructions about their own memorial service or funeral arrangement, maybe like what songs they want or what scriptures, that sort of thing. But in this case, the memorial service was not to be just on one occasion, as we generally do, you know, kind of a final tribute paid to an individual by, by friends and relatives. No. Uh, instead, it was to be something that was regularly and repeatedly celebrated. So what is it that they were to do? Well, essentially, they were to copy what he had done, both his acts and his word. That is, they were to take, break, bless, explain, and share the bread and the cup. But what did these symbols of the bread and the cup signify? Well, he himself gave the explanation. Of, of the bread, he said, this is my body given for you. And of the wine, he said, this is my blood shed for you. So his death spoke to them from both of these symbolic elements. The bread didn't stand for his living body as he reclined there with them at the table, but for his body as it was soon to be given for them in death, broken, beaten, scarred. In the same way, the wine didn't stand for his blood as it flowed through his veins then while he spoke to them, but, but his blood which was to be shortly poured out for them for their sakes in death. But the evidence is plain and unavoidable. The Lord's Supper, or communion, which was instituted by Jesus himself, dramatizes not his birth or his life, not his words or his works, but only his death. And nothing could indicate more clearly the central significance which Jesus attached to his death. It was by his death that he wanted, above all else, to be remembered. There is then, it's safe to say, no Christianity without the cross. I mean, if the cross is not central to our religion, ours is not the religion of Jesus. And so the bread and the cup are deeply significant for us as believers because they represent the most fundamental part, the, the, the core of our faith. Without the cross, there's no salvation. Without the cross, there's no forgiveness. Without the cross, there's no sanctification. There's no healing. There's no eternal life. There's no church. There's no, there's no Christian. In other words, without the cross, there, there's nothing. We have no message without the cross. There's no salvation apart from the cross. I know that there are those who have wanted to preach a gospel without a cross. The cross is offensive, they say. I mean, all this talk about death and blood and suffering, it's gruesome, it's barbaric, it's archaic, they say. Others try to say that the cross isn't really even necessary. I mean, God's a God of love, and if we just follow the teachings and example of Jesus, then the world will be a better place. We don't need to talk about a cross. Listen, New Testament believers would have found such an idea unthinkable. The cross was at the very center of their preaching. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, declared, We preach Christ crucified. Yes, it's a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, he says, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, the, the cross is the, is the pillar, it's, it's the central support on which is built all that we believe and all that we do in our as Christians. I mean, you take away the cross and it all comes crashing down. And the communion service, with, with its simple elements of bread and wine, reminds us of the central and fundamental importance of that cross. So make it central. But secondly, make it understood. That was another one of Jesus' objectives in instituting the Lord's Supper, to make sure that the significance of his death was understood. In the communion service, Jesus was teaching not only about the centrality of his death, but also about the purpose of his death. As we see it recorded in, by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 and then by Matthew in this gospel, Jesus' words about the cup referred not only to his blood, but to the new covenant that was associated with his blood. And, and Matthew adds here, 
for the forgiveness of sins. We can't miss the fact here that Jesus is explaining why he was going to die or what his death was going to accomplish. That through the shedding of Jesus' blood in death, that God was taking the initiative to establish a new, a new pact or a covenant or agreement with his people. And that one of the greatest and most important provisions of that covenant will be the forgiveness of our sin. You see, to, to understand the meaning of Jesus' words, we, we really have to understand them in the context of all of Scripture and of the history of God's relationship with His people. Many centuries previously, God had entered into a covenant or an agreement with Abraham, promising to bless him with a good land and descendants as numerous as the stars. God renewed that covenant, you remember then, at Mount Sinai after rescuing uh, His people, Abraham's descendants from Egypt. And he pledged himself to be their God and to make them his people. And this covenant was ratified or, or sealed, if you will. How? Well, with the blood of a sacrifice. That's how agreements were made in those times. It was like putting your signature at the bottom of the treaty. It took the blood of a sacrifice. And so we see Moses at, at Mount Sinai in Exodus 24, for example. And he takes the blood of the sacrifice and he sprinkles it on the people. And he says, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Sounds a lot like Jesus' words that night in the upper room, doesn't it? The blood of the covenant. Well, hundreds of years went by. Uh, years in which God's people turned their back on him and they broke his covenant and they provoked his judgment until one day in the 7th century B.C., the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah and he said this, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like, like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke that covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. After Jeremiah's prophecy, more than six centuries went by. Years of waiting growing expectancy, until one evening in an upper room in Jerusalem, Jesus proclaimed in effect that that new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah was about to be established, that the forgiveness of sins promised as one of the distinctive blessings of that covenant was about to become available, and that the sacrifice to seal that covenant, that which would, would bring it into effect and make possible this forgiveness, would be the shedding of Jesus' own blood as a sacrifice on the Roman cross. I, I don't think it's possible to exaggerate this staggering nature of that claim. Here's Jesus' own view of his own death. It is the divinely appointed sacrifice by which the new covenant with its promise of salvation and forgiveness will be ratified, will come into effect. He was going to die in order to bring his people into a new covenant, a, a new agreement, a whole, a whole new relationship with God. Jesus wants you to understand that this morning. He wants you to understand what his death on the cross means for you. But he also wants you to make it yours. And I believe that that is the, is the third lesson that we see here that Jesus was teaching. The need to appropriate his death personally. In other words, to take what Jesus' death accomplished on the cross, the forgiveness of sin that we just spoke of, and to make it a reality in our own lives. If we're right in saying that in the upper room there, that Jesus was, was giving a kind of an advanced dramatization of his death through these symbols of the bread and the cup. It's important to observe what form that drama took. It didn't consist of one actor, Jesus, with a dozen disciples in the audience. No, it involved them as well as him, so that they took part in it as well as he did. I mean, true, he took and he blessed and broke the bread, but then he explained its significance and gave it to them to eat. And again, he took and he blessed the cup, but then he explained its meaning and he gave it to them to drink. They weren't just spectators of this drama of the cross. They were participants in it. And this morning, as, as we celebrate communion, you're not just watching something that's going on up front. You're also invited to receive the bread and the cup and to eat and to drink. And the disciples can hardly have failed to, to, to get the message, just like it wasn't enough for the bread to be broken and the wine to be poured out, but they also had to eat it and drink it. 
So it was not enough for Christ to die, but they had to appropriate the benefits of his death personally. In other words, they had to accept that he died not just for sin, but for their sin. Not just to establish a new covenant, but to break down the barriers so that they could have a personal relationship with God. The eating of the bread and the drinking from the cup were, and still are, a vivid, acted out parable, if you will, of receiving Christ as our Savior and of allowing Him, the bread of life, to be our life. Jesus had already taught that in His great sermon about the, about the living uh, bread in, in John chapter 6, following His feeding of the 5,000. He said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat of the Son of Man and drink of His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Uh, That sounds pretty gruesome if we don't understand it symbolically in the light of the the object lesson that's being taught here in the symbols of the Lord's Supper. We're we're not literally eating human flesh and drinking blood. Of course not. No, the, the, the purpose of his words are to remind you that that which you are commemorating symbolically needs to be made yours spiritually. I mean, Jesus' words on that occasion and his actions in the upper room both teach us the same thing. For him to give his body and blood in death was one thing. For us to make the blessings of his death our own is another. But I found that many people don't seem to have gotten this. You know, they don't seem to understand that any action on their part is necessary. There are many people who imagine that because Christ died, the world has automatically been put right. You know, and, and when you explain to them that Christ died for them, they, they respond in a huff saying, well, you know, everybody knows that, as if the fact in itself or their knowledge of that fact has brought them salvation. But you know, the, the, the fact that there's a cure for a disease or even that we know about the cure doesn't cure us, does it? The fact that a vaccine for COVID has been discovered and, and produced doesn't make us all safe, does it? We have to receive the cure ourselves. We have to make the, take the medicine or get the vaccine or whatever. And in the same way, God doesn't impose his gift of salvation on us. We have to receive it by faith. So just as you are invited to reach out and take that piece of bread or that cup this morning, you're being reminded of the need for every person to reach out and receive the salvation which Christ has made available on the cross, to make it yours. Because if you don't make it yours, it, it has no effect. Today, after this service, probably most of you are going to have your Sunday dinner. But, you, you know, you can have a table that's loaded with food. You can smell its wonderful aroma. You can even pull up a chair and have a seat at the table. But if you don't eat, I mean, if you don't take in that food, you'll receive none of its nutritional benefits. In fact, It's possible, theoretically, to starve to death while sitting regularly at a table with a meal prepared and ready. And friends, it's entirely possible to starve to death spiritually while sitting in church every Sunday because we never made it ours. We never received this gift of salvation. We never accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offers to us through his death on the cross. Listen, you've got to make it yours. And if you've never done that, I invite you to do that today, to receive that salvation that Christ has made available to you through his death on the cross. So here then are the lessons of the communion about the death of Christ. First, make it central. It was clearly central to Jesus' own thinking about himself and his mission, and he wants it to occupy a central place in our lives as well. Christ's death on the cross means everything to us as Christians. Secondly, make it understood. The purpose of these symbols of the bread and the cup is to help us to understand the purpose of Christ's death, that it took place in order to establish the new covenant and to bring us salvation and forgiveness. Thirdly, make it yours. Just as you receive and take of the bread and the cup this morning individually as a participant, not just as an observer, so the salvation represented in the Lord's Supper needs to be appropriated individually if its benefits, the the forgiveness of God and the relationship with Him are to be enjoyed. Have you made it yours? Have you received forgiveness of your sin by a decision and faith to accept the salvation that only He can give you? If not, you can make it yours today. Let's pray together. Our loving and merciful God, we, we thank you for this
special moment when we remember again all that you have done for us through the cross. And as we commemorate and celebrate the death of Christ that has brought us freedom and forgiveness, we, we pray that we might do so not simply out of habit or tradition, but, but fully conscious of our own need and of your provision for that need, that apart from Jesus' death for our sins, that we could never have come into your presence or been cleansed from our sin by our own effort. So may this be a truly significant time as we once again partake of the bread and the cup this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare for communion in just a moment, I encourage you to take these moments to, to prepare your heart uh, in a time of, of, of prayer. So why don't we uh, take some time for silent prayer as we prepare for communion. As we come to communion uh, this morning, let, let me read another passage of Scripture that's, that's very familiar uh, to many of us. And uh, if in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, when he's writing to these uh, new believers and talking to them about the, the communion service or the Lord's Supper and its significance. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. This morning as we uh, celebrate communion together, I, I try to imagine what it would have been like to have been there on that first uh, occasion there in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples and to have received from Jesus the bread and the cup with those significant words that he gave to it and that are so meaningful for us as we've been talking about from, from God's word today. And so I hope that even as we celebrate this morning that you, will, um, that you will consider that as you receive the bread and, and the cup that you are receiving it from the Lord's hand because really that's what it represents, that, that the salvation that we have that we receive. We receive from His hand. It has nothing to do with ourselves, but it's from Him and all that He has accomplished. And so let's, let's uh, receive that as from the Lord this morning. Would you pray with me? Lord, how grateful we are for all that You have accomplished for us, what we could never have done on our own. And Lord, we, 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 we just can hardly imagine, Lord, that, that though we have rebelled against you, though we were sinned against you, though we were far from you, that you still out of love sent your Son to the cross to die in our place. Though we did not deserve it, though we had resisted you, Lord, you did that out of love. And so we give you praise and worship today for your grace and your mercy poured out toward us. For for this um, 
bread and this cup that represent to us your broken body and your shed blood that is the only means of our salvation. And so we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We, we, we remember that this morning. We celebrate it. And um, Lord, we, we um, are reminded again of how important it is for us and for our own faith. So we pray, Lord, your blessing upon this time as we uh, reflect on what you have done for us. And we thank you again for these elements that represent your broken body and your shed blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture tells us that there at that meal that Jesus took bread and he broke it and gave thanks for it and then he passed it to his disciples. And he said to them, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together in remembrance of all that he's done for us. In the same way, on that night there in the upper room, that Passover meal, Jesus took a cup and he blessed it and he passed it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing grace poured out toward us, undeserving though we were. And so we, we are thankful, Lord, and we have joyful hearts as we remember your death um, and all that it has accomplished for us. May we go, Lord, in, in the strength of that salvation that we receive from you, and may we also share that with others who also need to know and understand that same truth. So thank you, Lord, and may your blessing be on your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.